Good morning, those of us that have joined us so far. Um, we might have a few more joining as we go along, so if you see the list growing, please don't panic. Uh, they are all meant to be there. Um, just wanted to welcome you all to ARU's History Fest. Uh, normally, we would hold this event on our campus, but obviously, as you know, we are having to hold it virtually instead. Uh, however, we're really excited to do so, uh, and we're really pleased that we can still bring this event to you in your homes. Um, a few bits of virtual housekeeping to go over first. Uh, you will have been told this numerous times in, in the communications you've been had, but please make sure you keep your video cameras off because uh, you won't need them to be on. Uh, please make sure you stay muted as well. Uh, if you do need to ask us anything or wanted to contribute to the conversations, you can do so by typing into the chat function uh, and we'll try and make sure we can answer those at the end of the session. If for any reason there are any technical issues or you can't hear anyone or you are kicked out of the meeting for whatever reason, please email me on the link that you had that was sent to you the other day uh, and I'll get back to you as quick as I can and try and resolve those issues for you. Other than that, there shouldn't be any problems. Everything should go swimmingly, um, but obviously with the world of tech, there might be some issues, so please bear with us if there are any. Um, but other than that, most important thing is to please enjoy the session. Uh, and if you would like to sign up for any more sessions later on in the week, you can still do so. Um, other than that, I'll hand over to Will and Rowan, who will take it away. Brilliant, thanks very much. So, uh, welcome everybody to History Fest 2020 and to this talk, which is on history at university. Um, I was going to start by kind of getting you all just to um, say that you could see and hear us. Hopefully you can see and hear us. If you can't, then do say something um, in the chat and uh, Rob may be um, able to assist you. But I wanted to also start by introducing ourselves. So my name is, is Dr. William Tullett. I'm a lecturer in history at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. And I teach a wide range of history from the 16th century to the 20th century, from British history to global history, and from history of objects and biographies to histories of emotions and sound. And as a researcher, I work on sensory history. So the way people smelled, tasted, looked, touched and listened in the past. And my principal period of research is the long 18th century, which is sort of from the, the end of the Stuarts to the start of the Victorian period. Um, so I'll just let Rowan very briefly introduce himself now before we move on. Um, so Rowan. Great, and uh, everybody, welcome to History Fest. Uh, my name is Rowan McWilliam. I'm Professor of Modern British History here at Anglia Ruskin University. I really hope you're going to enjoy this week and enjoy this talk. Um, uh, my specialist areas are modern British uh, uh, and American history. Um, and I look particularly at political and social history. So I really take up the period after Dr. Tollett ends. Brilliant. Thanks, Ryan. So um, in today's session, uh, we're going to be talking about history at university. So we're going to be talking um, what a history degree is like, what it includes, what kind of things you uh, might expect to encounter in a history degree at university. We're going to be discussing why history is a great degree to do at university and hopefully we'll sort of bust some myths there about the kind of comparisons that are made between science subjects and other subjects like history. Um, and finally, we're going to be thinking about what kind of people study history and, of course, the kinds of people that a BA in history, a degree in history, uh, produces at the other end um, when you've finished your degree. And towards the end of the session, hopefully there'll be 10 minutes or so for you to ask some uh, questions. So I'm going to kick things off from the first half and then Rowan's going to uh, be doing the second half of the talk. So I wanted to start with that question, what is studying history like? Well, in a sense, it involves studying everything, and that might seem a kind of vague answer, but in a sense, it's true, because to be a good historian, you need knowledge of a whole range of areas of human society and culture, right? You need to master different techniques for analysing human society, and indeed non-human society, because there's a, a, a vibrant history of animals now as well. Um, and so the diversity of history makes it an exciting degree to take on because you're ranging across a whole range of periods and places and topics, but it also makes history a useful, employable degree that shapes you into a critical, analytical thinker. And why is this important? Well, most of the problems we face as a society that we all need to solve over the next, you know, 10, 20 years require a combination of different approaches. And as a BA history student, 
you spend three years sampling a whole series of different approaches to the way we understand society. So for example, we could turn to the current COVID-19 pandemic and think about the problems we need to solve during this pandemic, right? So we need a vaccine and, and scientists are kind of working on that. And we need trained medics who can look after patients. But there are also a whole series of other questions that need solving, right? How do you get a lockdown to work? How do you then allow people to go outside safely? How do we make key policy decisions? Um, how do we get messages about those decisions to the public? Um, and how do we understand how populations then respond to the pandemic and to the policies that we're instituting? And I could go on and the list could be endless, but the point is that despite what the government might tell you, the pandemic is not just a scientific problem. It's a human problem and a social problem and a cultural problem. And so it's a problem that's centered on how people act and why they act that way and how we might encourage them to act in a different way. And being a historian is about acquiring the skills and ways of thinking that help you attempt to answer those problems. Um, and so in order to demonstrate the kind of diversity that's at the heart of a modern BA history degree, I thought I'd use another recent example with which I hope you're all quite familiar. And that is, how do we understand Edward Colston's journey to the bottom of Bristol Harbour? So on the 7th of June 2020, a statue of Edward Colston that had been erected in the centre of Bristol in 1895 was pulled down. Um, Colston, who'd lived from 1636 to 1721, had been a slave trader with the Royal African Company, and the protests that led to the statue being taken down and deposited eventually in the harbour were part of a global movement of anti-racism that had responded to the death of George Floyd, a black American, at the hands of police brutality. And this kind of led to a lot of hand-wringing on the part of politicians and the press. There were claims that history was being erased, history was being rewritten. But of course, statues are not history. Statues celebrate that history analyzes. And history is always rewritten because we find new evidence and we take new angles on historical problems. It's never static. So we're not going to deal too much with those claims here about whether this is rewriting history, because it's a kind of demonstrates a fundamental inability to grasp what history is actually about. But what about if we wanted to understand the pulling down of Colston statue as a historical event? What would we need to know as historians? Well, we'd need to employ a whole different range of types of history, right? We'd need to understand changing ideas about race and racism and national identity and the concept of history itself. So we'd need intellectual history, which is all about the history of ideas. We want to understand how Colston made his money as a merchant in the first place, so we need economic history, and part of that would be understanding why slavery was profitable in the first place. Um, we want to understand how people consumed the profits and products of slavery. Um, and we'd also want to understand why a statue of Edward Colston was put up 174 years after his death. So we want to understand what attitudes had led Colston to be celebrated in the 1890s and then why those attitudes had changed by June 2020. So to do that, we'd need histories of attitudes and perceptions. So we'd need social and cultural history. And Colston's statue was made in a particular way. It was put up at a time when statues had become cheaper to make, easier to reproduce, um, and in which statues were more common than ever. Um, in the late uh, 19th century as miniature versions in homes as well as in public spaces. So to understand all about statue production, we'd need the history of technology and production. Um, and we'd want to understand the contemporary context of the pandemic and how that led to the protests. So we'd actually probably want to draw on the history of medicine as well. Um, and finally, of course, we'd want to understand why protesters took the steps to take the statue down in the first place. And so to do that, we'd need to understand how slavery and its and the British past was represented in contemporary history, in heritage, in national memory, so in places like museums and schools and stuff, so we'd need public history as well. And once we start to dig deeper into all of these different areas of history, to really get to the bottom of the statue's life and its place in our understanding of the past, we'd have to understand a colossal range of themes, right? So we'd have to understand histories of race and racism to understand why slavery had been accepted in Colston's time and the long struggle for civil rights and against racism, of which the George Floyd protests have formed the latest part. Um, if we want to understand how Colston got his money and how he spent it and how Colston represented one example of the broader riches acquired through the slave trade in Britain, then we'd need to understand the economic history of the 17th and 18th century. Britain. We need to understand the trends in fashion 
that made sugar and tobacco and slave produced products so valuable. We want to understand the history of charity and philanthropy because one of the reasons that a statue of Colston is put up in the 1890s is supposedly because of all the charity and philanthropy that he pursued in Bristol during his lifetime with the riches that he'd acquired from the slave trade. Um, and Colston only actually dispensed that charity to those who were of the same political and religious beliefs. So we probably want to know something about religion and politics in, in, in Colston's lifetime in Bristol and elsewhere. And of course, we'd also want to know the political history of Bristol in the 19th century and the history of empire and colonization in the 19th century to understand why a crisis of empire in the 1890s had led to people putting up statues of heroes, um, or heroes in inverted commas, across Britain's towns and cities. Um, we could go on and on, right? The statue of Edward Colston is a man. Why do we tend to venerate men and commemorate men in public spaces? There are very few statues of women, so we might want to think about gender. We want to think about the fact that this is a statue in a public space. So what's the history of public space and our relationship to public space and who gets to control public space? Um, and finally, of course, as we've already said, we want to understand national identity and heritage and the myths we tell ourselves about our past. And to do all of that, we need to think about multiple chronological scales. So um, we look, work at the scale of Colston's own life and contextualise his actions, but we'd also need to place them in a longer history of the early modern period, so the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, which is a period when European states are, are busy colonising countries across the globe and when the slave trade really is a global trade. We need to think about the 19th century and the moment when the statue went up in the first place, um, and the contemporary moment when the statue was taken down. Um, and we'd also need to think about causes and how different causes lead to events. So why do attitudes to race and racism change and how do they change? And why do statues get toppled and what leads them to being toppled? And as that suggests, we'd be looking at multiple scales. So we'd be looking at hundreds of years, we'd be looking at decades, we'd be looking at months, and we'd be looking at the time on June the 7th between 1 p.m. when a protest march starts in Bristol and 3.50 p.m when the statues dropped into the water at Bristol Harbour. And so we need to think about why all this happened. We'd also need to think about the consequences of that act of taking the statue and putting it in the water for the protesters, for the national conversation about slavery, for Bristol and so on and so forth. Um, and finally, we'd have to deal with the fact that figures like Coulston, as with many historical themes and topics, reappear and disappear throughout history, right? History isn't kind of one linear narrative, things crop up again and again. And as all this suggests, we'd also be using multiple geographical scales, right? So we'd move from the centre of Bristol, where the Colston statue sat, to the city of Bristol as a whole, to the place of slavery in the regional economy in which Bristol sat, to the role of race and slavery in our national histories, to the fact that slavery was an Atlantic trade with global implications, and the fact that the protest movement that led to the statue being taken down was a global protest movement. So we'd be travelling on foot through 19th and 20th century Bristol, on ships across the Atlantic during Edward Colston's lifetime, and through Twitter, Facebook and Instagram as we follow how protests spread across the world in 2020. So we'd be working at these multiple geographical scales. And finally, we'd have to work with a whole series of different types of history, right? So one of the things you'll engage with at university is the idea that history is produced in multiple forms from a variety of different angles by a whole range of very different people. And to understand the Colson statue, we want to obviously read academic books on slavery and empire and black history. We would need to engage with popular histories and how they frame debates over slavery and race. We need to understand what the difference is between history, the study of the past, and heritage, the stuff that we've inherited from the past and the myths we make about the past. And to do that, we've had to engage with the work of public historians who work in museums and schools and with community projects. That might involve working with think tanks like the Runnymede Trust, who re recently put together an excellent website project on migration and, and history in the UK. It might involve uh, very big museums like the, the National International Slavery Museum in, in, in Liverpool, but also smaller local museums. Um, it might involve assessing whether and if so, how slavery is represented um, in national trust, trust properties, which were often built on the wealth that slavery um, generated. So we'd have to involve a whole kind of diverse set of people, um, all with very different perspectives on the past. And that includes things like politicians, it includes the news media and the way they represent the past as well. 
And all of this that I've sort of described is involved in studying history at university. Across those three years, you're understanding a diverse range of places and peoples and perspectives. You're being able to think about the big and the small, so the global and the local, um, the, lo the long and the short term, individual sources and a vast array of material. Um, and you're also engaging with different audiences, um, different forms of media, whether that's objects or newspapers or video or audio, and different techniques of analysis for understanding those sources. Um, so, for example, these are just some of the modules that we run at the, on the BA History at ARU, and they give you a kind of a sense of some of the diversity on offer. It's not everything that we offer, but these are some examples. Um, and creating the past history today and the dissertation, for example, are all about giving you the techniques to research and write and to understand multiple perspectives on the past. And some of the other modules demonstrate that kind of breadth of thematic coverage in terms of the themes that we might look at on a, on a history degree, um, but also the, the, the breadth of chronological coverage. So from things like empire to gender, from global to British history, and from the 16th century to the 20th century. And of course, it's worth mentioning um, that this wide breadth and depth of knowledge makes history graduates very sought after in the job market. So these are just a few of the places our graduates go, go on to work, and they're quite representative of the kinds of places that history graduates in general go on to work. So we've got the civil service, law firms, charities, schools, marketing companies, libraries, museums and galleries, and the police force. So a whole range of different careers, and that's just um, a few of them. And in some ways that might surprise you, um, not least because our government and our media frequently like to tell us that science subjects, STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and medicine are more important, right? But actually, the humanities and social sciences, including subjects like history, are just as employ employable and important. Um, so don't be fooled by those kinds of claims. Um, so Institute for Fiscal Studies report in 2020 suggested that the salary gains made by those who studied a history BA were larger than a whole range of disciplines, and that included physics, biosciences, and a range of humanities and social science subjects. Um, and just to give you one more example, because I think this is really important that we kind of bust those myths about history not being an important and employable degree. Um, a report that was, that's, that's just come out in the last few months from the British Academy showed that graduates in the humanities and social sciences were just as well placed as, as STEM graduates in the job market. In fact, in some respects, they were better off. Um, they were just as resilient to downturns, just as likely to be employed as STEM graduates, but they're also working in a wider range of sectors than, than STEM graduates and more likely to be working in the fastest growing, most exciting areas of the economy. So doing a history degree is, is not only fantastic fun and exciting and, and, and intellectually engaging, but it's also still a really rewarding, potentially highly flexible way of getting into a whole variety of careers. And so I'll finish before I pass on to Rowan by saying this, that historians are, by all accounts, the people who will do the jobs of the future. Um, the World Economic Forum recently produced a report in which they listed the top 10 skills for jobs now and in the future. And if you take a look at this list, um, these are all the types of skills that you get from doing a history degree, right? The robots can do the maths, but they can't be human. And these are human qualities that are developed through being intellectually curious. And many of the problems we'll face in the future, the key things that we'll have to, have to grapple with as, as human society, revolve around a single question. How do societies work, right? And history can help us answer that question again and again, because it gives us a giant human laboratory full of ready-made examples, complete with useful techniques to understand them, that will help us figure out what makes people tick and why, okay? So I'll hand over to uh, Rowan now, who's gonna take us through um, the rest of the presentation. Brilliant, thanks Will. And, and in fact, can we go straight into the next slide after this? Brilliant. But, uh, and in fact, I want to, um, uh, uh, to, to start really where Will has just left off. Um, uh, about 10 years ago, the Guardian newspaper did a, a study of uh, the most successful figures in modern British industry. Uh, and uh, the, they asked them what degree that they did, what degree did they do? And uh, they found that um, rather than having studied, say, studies you'd ex subjects you'd expect, like, say, engineering, many of the most successful entrepreneurs had studied history, had taken history at university. And so they were asked, well, 
Uh, do you think um, history has that made any difference to your working life? After all, you don't spend a lot of time writing history essays, do you? Um, and uh, they said uh, uh, that actually history had made a lot of difference to the work that they did. Uh, and it was for the, because of those skills that Will was just showing you. Um, what, what does a history degree give you? Well, they argued it gave them skills in research, in data analysis, in the critical reading and interpretation of evidence, uh, skills of problem solving, of effective communication, of an ability to persuade, to bring people over to your side of an argument, an ability to understand where another person is coming from. Okay, all of those are qualities I think that you develop through studying history at university. Well, when he was um, uh, running for the presidency in 1960, John F. Kennedy was asked what his greatest asset was as a, pres a potential president. And he replied, <clears throat> uh, he thought it was his sense of history. Um, and Kennedy actually had written a number of historical works. Uh, and what he meant by that, uh, by his sense of history, was that he felt that he could understand the historical forces that were present in the world at that time. He understood where they come from uh, and how he could manage them as president of the United States. So, uh, so those are, I think, some of the, the, I think, the really valuable things that we get from studying history. Um, and in fact, you can see in this uh, photograph my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Davis, um, uh, teaching a group of students here at university. Can we, um, can we uh, uh, go on to the next slide? <clears throat> Now, I thought um, I'd talk to you a little bit about what kind of graduate are we trying to create when we teach a history degree? Um, um, or what will you become, or who will you become, if you study history? Well, I think the first argument I would make about this um, is I hope you would become somebody who has real, takes real pleasure in the past. Now, there are all sorts of arguments for studying history, um, uh, uh, and, and they're all true. But I think unless the, uh, we enjoy history, unless we are fascinated by the past, unless it's something that, we, um, that gives us pleasure, then I'm not sure I see, I see the point of it. Um, but I think to be a historian is to be somebody who cannot walk down a street without wondering what it was like a hundred years before okay if you if you have that ever had that thought then you're a historian or here in this photograph um we uh, see some of our students so uh, when we took them to paris and you can uh, you can see me right at the back um and we're, we're, we're all standing outside the paris opera and it was great it was a great pleasure to walk around paris with our students showing them the historical sites of paris so i think history is about encounters with people in the past. We are explorers trying to find out about how they lived their lives. We want to know about the ways in which their values were different from ours. Now, some people say, oh, well, history, isn't that just about nostalgia or escapism? Isn't your head just stuck in the past? Um, uh, when people say that to me, I have to disagree. <clears throat> um, I think history is about engaging with the world that we live in today. It is about shaping the future. It is about deciding what kind of future do we want to live in, but we can make that decision through understanding where we have been in the past. We are the ones who tell you how we got here. We control memory. And of course, that's fundamentally what history is. It's about memory. It's about understanding what's at stake in the big issues of today. Um, now this, you know, if we can go to the next slide, um, this passion for the past should even, I think, extend uh, to the houses in which we live. Unless you live in a brand new house, which of course you may do, um, then what fascinates me about um, the houses that we live in is that other people lived in these houses. Uh, you're seeing me here uh, in, in my uh, living room. Um, I live in a late Victorian house. Uh, I moved into it about 20 years ago. 
And one, what fascinates me about um, this house and indeed about this room is that there have been several generations of strangers to me who've lived in my house, in my flat. What kind of lives did they live, live in? There's been at least, uh, 120 years of people living in this room that I'm in uh, today. Um, uh, and they, in a sense, that's really what history is. History, I would argue, is one big haunted house, okay? Um, and it's about conversations with ghosts. Um, and I want to ask those ghosts from the past, why, if you were in the 17th century, why was it natural and sensible to believe in witchcraft? Um, uh, or I want to ask, and this goes back to um, uh, Will's example, the Colston statue. Why did apparently good people believe slavery was okay? Or, going back into the 20th century, um, why did apparently good people think fascism was okay? Those are questions, as a historian, I want to ask. Or well, a slightly different thing. Um, what was it like to be in the war room with Winston Churchill making the big decisions in the fight against Hitler? Okay, if you enjoy those kinds of questions, if you want to ponder them, then I think um, history is important. Now, in my view, history is also a, a degree in learning how to think. And can I go into the next slide? And I think uh, thinking like a historian is, a, is distinctive. As historians, we do not believe that history is uh, one damn thing after another, just a series of accidents or, 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 uh, or, uh, or events. Sure, I mean, obviously there are accidents in history. You could argue that the um, First World War was caused by the Archduke Franz Ferdinand's driver taking the wrong turning at Sarajevo, which is true, actually. Uh, uh, he, he wasn't meant to be going down the road he, uh, that he was going when the assassin Gavrilo Princip uh, uh, spotted uh, the car and killed the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. It wasn't meant to happen like that, okay? But it set in train a series of events uh, which led to the First World War. So maybe the First World War happened by accident. Alternatively, historians would argue, it happened because of deeper forces, about the clash of empires, going, dating back to the 19th century, about the rise of militarism and that big historical force, nationalism. It, it occurred because of the conflict over the balance of power in Europe. Okay, all of those deep underlying forces led to the First World War. Okay, now um, we endlessly debate this. Um, maybe you think that the First World War happened by accident. That's fine. Or you, you may want, want to ponder, did it happen because of those deep historical forces? Okay, but those are big questions that we deal with at university. I often use the metaphor with, in my classes with students of a car when thinking about history. I always ask them, well, what is the motor driving the, the historical process forward? Okay, what, what does it actually look like? Alternatively, over the years, I've noticed many historians enjoy detective stories. I think that's quite appropriate because historians are detectives at the end of the day. We, look, we probe the past for clues to explain what drives change. Um, and we insist that the past has a shape to it. It's not just a formless set of events. Um, so, for example, we argue that the beginning and the end of the First World War uh, were defining moments. Europe after 1918 was in some respects at least a different place. People thought differently after the war. Uh, historians argue that total war uh, acts as a catalyst for social change. Um, although these changes didn't, weren't necessarily evident to people in 1918 or 1919, they only became apparent later. And that is, the, I think, the value of having a historical perspective. Sometimes we need a bit of distance from the past in order to see what was really going on. 
Um, I'm always fascinated to think about, well, what would um, uh, historians make of 2020? Will they say the big event, as Will was saying, was, was it COVID-19? Uh, was it uh, the George Floyd killing? Maybe, maybe it is. Um, or maybe it'll turn out there's something that's really important in 2020 that you and I are not aware of, okay, that will only become apparent later on. Maybe those deep historical forces are working in a different way, but we'll only be able to see them later on in, uh, in the fullness of time. That's the value, I think, of a historical perspective. If we can go into the next slide. Um, I think a, a good historical de history degree should give you a sense of the diversity of history. And I mean diversity in, this, in, in all sorts of ways, um, but, but in one particular way. Um, I think we should be ready to look at history, uh, you know, from a top-down perspective. You know, to think about politics, to think about kings and queens. Um, uh, some people uh, say about history, oh, isn't it all just kings and queens? Well, I have no problem with, with the history of kings and queens. Um, uh, history of monarchy actually, uh, historically, has actually been very important. Uh, monarchs make a difference. I do, however, have a real problem with history if it's only kings and queens. Um, I'm uh, just as interested in history from the bottom up. I want to know about the history of everyday life. I want to know, say, about this 1950s family here having dinner. Um, or, or, or maybe it's breakfast. Um, uh, I want to know about their lives. I want to, uh, uh, maybe uh, the children in the, that photograph, maybe they're still alive. Maybe I could send my students off to interview them to do what we call oral history, to find out about what it was like growing up in the 1950s. Okay, so history is about Henry VIII, uh, but it's also about a 1950s family. <clears throat> um, um, uh, if, we, if we go into the next slide, I'm also very struck by the way in which history is uh, not just about individual countries. Again, I'm all in favour of that. I don't teach both Britain and the history of the United States as well. But I think one of the great growth areas of our times is global history. And a slightly different thing, transnational history. Um, I notice that many younger historians are often saying that they, they don't want to be bound by the nation state. They see historical forces changing, bringing change across the globe. Um, in which case, if you want to understand those forces, you need to have a global perspective. Um, <clears throat> what do I mean? Um, uh, for, I, I'm talking about forces like religion. Uh, I, I, the, uh, the, the Protestant Reformation was a, a global event. I'm thinking about capitalism and the coming of the market. I'm thinking about uh, the uh, family structure uh, and gender. Um, uh, these were not confined to one country or another. We can see they're part of global change. So as historians, we need to map them. Although we usually end up saying that these historical forces uh, were different from one country to another. As part of this new global history, <clears throat> we're interested in migration. Many of us <clears throat> Uh, have families who came from other countries or from other parts of the world <clears throat> or at least from different parts of this country. So our own histories is often a, a story of migration. Uh, migration has been one of the dynamic forces in the making uh, of the modern world and historians are trying to track that and think about the consequences of it. <clears throat> uh, if we can go to the next uh, slide. I think history is also about becoming a good citizen. Um, and when I talk about citizenship, I, I don't just mean um, the freedom to vote every few years, though I, of course that's true. I think being a good citizen uh, is about acquainting ourselves with the big issues of our time and having a, a, a feeling about them. We need, to be a citizen, you need knowledge. You need to know what's going on. <clears throat> and to some extent, you need history as well, okay? Uh, so I think history is about creating good citizens for the future. Um, and um, uh, I'm sometimes disappointed if I hear uh, <clears throat> history students tell me 
that they're not going to vote in an election. I, I'd never tell a student what to vote. You should always be free to vote for whoever you like. But I'm disappointed if people, history students, don't vote. Because one of the things we get from history um, is an understanding of what a struggle it was for people to get the right to vote. Some people <clears throat> lost their lives in the struggle for the vote or had to sacrifice um, uh, themselves in various ways or spent time in jail for the right to vote. Um, and, and as a historian, you understand it. And I'll give you, I mean, a great example of this would be uh, Rosa Parks, in, in, who has, I'm sure many of you know, in 1954, effectively kicked off the modern civil rights movement in the United States. Um, as a black woman, she refused uh, to move from the whites only section of a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and she was arrested. Um, and that actually sparked the modern civil rights uh, movement, okay? Uh, so that's Rosa Parks in 1954, at a time uh, when many black people were not allowed to vote, uh, or indeed to participate in society uh, more generally. Fast forward to 2008, and we see the first black president of the United States, Barack Obama, sitting in that bus in the seat from which Rosa Parks uh, was moved, okay? Um, uh, that's uh, the difference that her stance made, okay? You can't have Barack Obama sitting on that bus without um, uh, Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat. Um, and that's what we discover in history, and that's why history matters. And if we can go then into my final slide, of course, this takes us back to the Colston statue. This shows us that these events are commemorated in a 19th century statue about a 17th century figure, that they are still important. Um, uh, they still make a difference to the world that we live in today because they say something about what kind of world do we live in and what kind of people do we want to become. That, I think, is the difference that a history degree makes, because we understand, as historians, the issues. Thank you. Great. So uh, thank you um, to everybody for listening. Um, we've now got about a quarter of an hour, 15 to 10, 10 15 minutes. Um, so if you have any questions, um, hopefully you do have some questions, um, then um, please feel free to type them in the chat, and then we will answer them generally for everybody. Um, if you can't think of any questions now, fine. Um, but if you do think of any later, um, my email address is here on the slides, um, william.tullet at anglia.ac.uk. Um, and I'd be very happy to respond if you've got questions about doing a history degree, in particular about doing a history degree um, at Anglia Ruskin um, University here in Cambridge. So if anybody's got any broader questions about what they've heard, um, then please do ask away. I'd be very happy to answer. And now we're going to have the awkward moment where we kind of sit here yeah. and, sort of <laughs> and look urgently at the chat to see if any questions appear. Um, should really feel like there should be some lift music or something playing in the background while we... While yeah, we... Whilst, we, whilst we think about any, que any questions that we... Um... <laughs> This could be questions as well about uh, studying history at university in general. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be about anything you've heard in the, the talk today as well. So if you wanted to ask anything in particular about what it's like to study at ARU, uh, I'm sure Will and Rowan will be able to help with that as well. But like you said, it is that awkward silence <laughs> for the first few minutes. Hopefully not for all 15 minutes. <laughs> no. We can perhaps wait for about a minute or two more, and then if people don't have questions, we'll we'll let them go. We won't make them sit here in <laughs> in silence. Um, I count about four people, mm -hmm. maybe more than that. But um, uh, if you know, if people don't have questions, then please also just say you don't have any questions. <laughs> um, that's fine um, because if 
enough of you say that you don't have any questions and we don't get any questions in the next five minutes or so, then of course we can um, end the session. Um, Oh, I should add while we're waiting, um, if you want to find out more about studying history at university and why you should study history at university, um, this is a great book that's just come out. Oh, yeah. um, why Study History um, by uh, Marcus Collins and Peter Stearns. It's about both his studying history in the UK and in the US. Um, and it's really, really good, um, particularly in kind of busting some of those myths about you know, like demonstrating that history is really employable as a degree, but it also gives you a, a broad sense of some of the things that you might study um, as, a, as a history undergraduate um, as well. So it's, a, it's quite a handy book if you're kind of thinking about studying history at university and want to find more in general. So it's um, Why Study History by Marcus Collins and Peter Stearns. Um, I don't get any commission, I just think it's quite a handy, um, handy book. Um, and worth looking at. Well, one thing I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, to you all, um, uh, I want I hope you've got a sense of, of just the range of history, not just the range of history here at Anglo Ruskin, but just all the different things you could do. Because um, I appreciate, you know, some people are attracted to certain kinds of things like sort of political history. Um, uh, some people really would like to do the every, uh, history of everyday life. Uh, but those, it's interesting, I hope you picked up that, for example, Will Tullett here is um, a historian of smell and, and, and he writes also, he's, I think going to be talking to you later on about the history of the body. It may, you, you, you may not think that smell or the body can have histories, uh, but he, but he's going to he, uh, show you. Yes, yes, um, uh, uh, they uh, they those things do have a history. In fact, they're the most basic forms of history, aren't they? Well, yeah, absolutely. And um, actually, we've just had a question um, uh, from Ava: Is history an internationally useful subject? For example, to live and work abroad. Um, I mean, I've certainly got some ideas there. I mean, and, and, I'll, and I'll hand over to Rowan once I've said a couple of things. But I think. A couple of things to kind of uh, point out is that history is all about understanding other cultures, right? Uh, in a kind of empathetic way, getting your head around a culture that's very different to your own, a society that's very different to your own. Um, and so in that sense, I think history is incredibly useful for working abroad because it makes you into a more uh, um, sympathetic person, a, more, a person who's more willing to understand different cultures and different societies and to a person who's more willing to see life from the perspective of somebody else I suppose which is ultimately what history is all really about it's trying to understand how people saw things in the past um, in the same way that kind of living and working abroad is, is about you trying to understand what it's like to live in this other culture that you're unfamiliar with so I think in that very basic level it's really important but also of course it presents you with a kind of um, cultural armory an arsenal of information about the world and about society that is is really really useful to provide you with the common ground that you might interact with other people on and so in that sense i think is 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 really useful uh, rowan i don't know if you want to add anything to what i've said yeah and i i, I agree with every, everything will has said uh, and I, I will say that's one of the reasons why, for example, Anglia Ruskin University, we have an international exchange program. Um, and uh, it's possible to spend a, uh, a um, semester of your degree uh, at universities in the United States or in Canada. Um, uh, and uh, I think a lot of our students have grown through that. They go and study history elsewhere. Um, uh, the, the other point I would make in addition uh, is that uh, around the world, as, as well as Britain, uh, employers uh, know what history is as a degree. Okay, that's not always true of some degrees, um, but if you say to an employer, well, I've done a history degree, they will almost certainly know the kinds of things you would have done, the kinds of skills you will have developed, um, and they'll know how to use that. Um, so I think that uh, so, so I think history is uh, Abra. I'll answer your question directly. I think it's an internationally uh, useful subject. Uh, it's worth saying that uh, uh, um, one of the great uh, um, uh, uses of it is to go and work in <clears throat> uh, international business, international diplomacy. You'll find a lot of people who are working, say, in the Foreign Office, um, have um, uh, um, history degrees. Um, uh, uh, we've got a former student of ours who um, uh, w w uh, got, uh, became a civil servant um, and he joined the Brexit ministry. Uh, and he told me that on his first day in the job, 
he found himself uh, having to, uh, you know, dealing with the question of Brexit, he, uh, he use history that he had learned here at uh, Anglia Ruskin University. Um, so I do think that this is useful. It is absolutely understanding something about the world, I mean the global world in which we live. Thanks, Rowan. Yeah, um, we've also got uh, someone else has asked a question about um, how many days a week you'd spend in lectures at university, for example, if you were doing um, a history degree. I mean, I think one of the important points to make there is, you, you know, if you were going to answer it directly, you might say, well, you'd probably spend about three days um, in an average week, probably in university doing um, lectures specifically or seminars. But when you're not in lectures or seminars, you're also doing a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So um, a history degree, you've got lectures where you're in a, a kind of uh, in the audience with, with somebody um, talking to you in a kind of slightly more kind of didactic kind of, you know, here's some stuff for you to know kind of way. You've got seminars which are far more interactive and really about discussion and you talking through issues together um, might involve group work and project work and presentations and all that kind of stuff, looking at sources together. Um, but there are a whole range of other things we do as well. So um, we often run sessions in museums and in archives, for example. So here at ARU, we have a module in first year called Creating the Past, where we go to the local Cambridgeshire collections, which is a big archive, and we give you boxes and boxes and boxes of archive material, and you get to root through it and find out about, about you know, find a bunch of sources and then put together a project on it. Um, and similarly, we've done stuff where we've gone to different museums, like the Fitzwilliam Museum or the Museum of Cambridge, for example. So when you're doing a history degree, you're not just in lectures, you're also in seminars, you're also doing group project work, you're also using a whole range of other things. And of course, you're reading, right? You're reading. And um, one of the things, you know, if you're a history student, that, that you're kind of, if we were going to put it in a very cynical way that your kind of fees are going towards, is a vast array of books in the library that you can use, um, physical books, e-books, um, and so on and so forth, that you will use in your studies. And so a lot of the study on a history degree is also about you making use of those resources. Um, not just books, also things like databases of primary sources and digital collections and stuff like that that we have um, on file, or even things like Box of Broad Broadcast International, which is a big database of um, basically everything that's been on terrestrial TV since the 19... 1960s 1970s you know so um so it's about making use of those resources as well um so it's about kind of individual study and group study and group work as well rowan i don't know if you want to add anything yeah I, actually there, there's another point i want to make about that although i agree with everything there. um uh, for me I mean, one of the reasons why i'm a historian and why i'm so passionate about st uh, studying history uh, is because i think history is just the great interdisciplinary subject um, uh, if, if you ask me, well, uh, what should you be interested in as a historian? I'd have to say everything. Um, I think what's great about history is it's also a pathway into all sorts of other things. Um, so to be a historian, it seems to me, you need to understand geography. Um, you need to understand um, uh, literature and art. You need to understand maybe philosophy even. Uh, you've got to think about ideas. Um, uh, uh, you need to understand science, in fact. Um, okay, it's a, it's a way of trying to get into all sorts of other subjects. Um, no subject is ever completely discreet in itself anyway. <clears throat> uh, one thing always leads into um, uh, something else, and that's what always strikes me. It's so exciting about history. Um, uh, and that's, again, why it's, it is so useful. It is a way of uh, being interested in everything. And I think the other thing that's worth mentioning, of course, is that doing a history degree at university allows you to pursue all of those diverse interests if you want. If you want to sit in the library and read about science and tech stuff because it will help you with an essay that you're doing on the history of science and technology, then great. You know, if, you, if you're interested in the whole range of periods that, 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 that are offered across the history degree, but you're not taking a particular module, you could still go and listen to the lectures on that module, even yeah. if you're not doing the assessment. So... There's plenty of opportunities to kind of for you to make the most out of your time basically and make the most out of the resources that are available to you um, and if you do that you could spend all week <laughs> in university if you wanted to um, you know or if you've got you know if you've got a job um, that you're doing part-time for example or you've got other commitments then you know you just spend the, the two or three days when you have seminars and lectures specifically um, or a museum visit or whatever that you need to go to so it's very much what you what you make of it really Oh, and, and I just make one more point, which, of course, on, on any history degree, you become a historian. 
in your own right. For example, um, you, you write a dissertation, which is usually a 10,000 word project on, on an original subject where you use original sources. So I think that, that's um, uh, an, an, another positive about the history degree. Yeah, so we've got uh, one other question, which is it kind of links to your question, your, your point, Rowan, about having oh, to yeah. know everything, really, um, which is how similar is history to social sciences like sociology, um, because some of the international history bits, gender, family, etc., seem to have an overlap. In some ways, um, history is very similar to, to, to sociology, um, but it's also slightly different in, in the sense that when I talked about towards the end of my bit of the talk about that kind of vast human laboratory, um, you know, history has access to this vast range of material. Um, and so it's interested in some of the same bigger questions as sociology, but it's pursuing those questions over a vast, much larger data set, in a sense. So I think that's one of the kind of one of the, the big differences. Um, uh, Rowan, I don't know if you've got any other suggestions. Yeah, no, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of some of the dissertations I've supervised. On, on the one hand, I've had people doing things like um, uh, uh, the, the Battle of Britain, for example. Um, but I've got, a, got one I'm supervising just at the moment, um, which is looking at the Victorian figure of the fallen woman in Victorian novels. So I'm actually getting a student who's doing history, but, you, but her sources are Victorian novels. Um, and so that, of course, that bleeds into uh, literature. Um, I'm a great believer in uh, the importance of social science. I think um, um, all historians make great social scientists um, uh, in, in, our, in our own particular kind of way. Um, uh, and of course, um, uh, we, we're also, uh, I've also had students, you asked about international history as well. I mean, um, uh, I've had students going on to do MAs in uh, international relations. Um, uh, you know, all of those, these, so these are very different things, social science, literature, international relations. You can go off in all sorts of directions. Uh, and that's why I think history is, is just a really uh, intellectually exciting three years. Um, and I think it's a really formative thing in your life. And I think the other thing to kind of recognize is that, um, a university, university, doing history at university gives you the opportunity to pursue those connections if you want to, right? So if you're a more sociologically minded historian, you know, then you can do things that overlap with sociology a bit more. If you're somebody who's also a bit interested in literature, fine, you know, do, do projects and look at themes that involve a literature aspect as well. Um, so I think there are plenty of opportunities to pursue kind of interdisciplinary, um, you know, where, where you're looking at sociology and history together, for example. And actually, when you get to university, one of the things you realize is that, particularly in second and third year, once you're beginning to do a lot more of your own research and picking your own topics, you know, you're having to read stuff from other disciplines anyway, right? So we had somebody who did a dissertation on the history of WWE wrestling, right? And for that, they would have had to read stuff on uh, sociology and of, of masculinity, for example, and sport and things like that, as well as the kind of more specifically historical work. So really, you know, in, in a way, what I'm saying is it's as similar as you want to make it. And that's kind of the beauty of, of doing a history degree, I think. Uh, Rowan, do you want to speak? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take that one. Um, uh, it, it, it's quite simple, actually. You um, spend the first semester of the second year uh, abroad, okay? Uh, and um, we've got a number of universities we're working with in the United States and in Canada. Um, and we've, look, we've looked at and okayed the, the courses that they teach uh, over there. Um, and you, you take uh, history courses over there, and they count for credit uh, in the Anglia system. So you, li you just literally do one semester abroad. Um, and uh, of course, it, uh, I've had students who do that and have come back and said it's quite simply, you know, one of the best experiences of their lives. Uh, first of all, because they experienced a different education system, which is, which is an education in itself. Um, but also, uh, students have found that it's a great opportunity to make friends uh, and to travel. I've had students uh, travel, you know, the, the whole breadth of the United States uh, and Canada, and they often send me postcards so I can see exactly where they are. Um, and um, uh, so, so it fits directly into the um, uh, Anglia degree. Yes. So I think, and I think also what ends up happening is any, 
you do the assessments that you would do at that university and then those assessments get converted into the credits that would function within the degree itself so um the marks get converted across basically so that it all fits um seamlessly together if we've got any more questions i think we're almost out of time actually yeah i think we've done quite well <laughs> yeah we've got uh, it's now um 11 o'clock um rob i don't know if uh if we want to end the session there unless anybody has any more kind of last minute uh questions that they really want to get answered before we go i think that's probably um, a perfect time to end really. Um, if anyone does have any questions that they think of after this, please again take a note of Will's email there uh, at the bottom of, of the PowerPoint and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them for you or send on to someone that can answer if he can't answer them himself. Um, but all I'd like to say is thank you very much to Rowan and Will for, for leaving that session. It was been really enjoyable. Um, as a past history graduate, I enjoyed being back in the, uh, the lecture environment. Um, and if anyone is already signed up to sessions later on in the week, we look forward to welcoming you back. Um, if anyone hasn't signed up to sessions later in the week but would like to, you can still do that. Um, so please have a look on that Eventbrite page again and, and sign up to any sessions that look like they might appeal to you. But other than that, I'd like to say have a lovely day. Uh, thank you again to Rowan and Will, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks for thank joining you. Guys. Enjoy History Fest. Thank you.